You keep feet on the ground, do you? Welcome back to Sikistan and welcome back to SNC Coaches React. Today we are looking at a very interesting episode of something. It's called the Ultimate Test. So it's part of the Lions Rugby Tour. So anyone who knows rugby will know what the Lions are. Anyone clicking on this who's uh, not involved in rugby. Essentially, the Lions are a team of Irish and UK athletes who join together and go play some of the Southern Hemisphere teams. This year was in South Africa. Sometimes it might be Australia or New Zealand. Uh, they lost to South Africa this year. Typically, it's it's very good rugby. It's very very entertaining media around the rugby, which is some of my favorite parts of it. The just like chasing the lines. They document it quite well on YouTube. Most of the time, the players are characters. Yeah, they're they're. they're it's it's a lot less. Um, there's obviously pressure to perform. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less kind of institutional pressure, yeah. or it seems that way anyway. Like it, it's very much a kind of open conversation a lot of time players are like vlogging in their own rooms as they're there uh, that's what really makes it for me is you you get a, a much better insight into that team's setup and that team dynamic obviously you can't have that kind of openness with a an international team like a national team due to the fact that that dynamic has to last for five or ten or fifteen years between the players mm -hmm. and you can't always be sharing that much you know? yeah there's a lot of uh, quote unquote banter yeah, lots of banter. Lots of banter. Lots of heavy drinking as well. I would think. Yeah, and great, great to see. To see. <laughs> so there is, there's three parts of this on episode two on the lines. I definitely recommend watching all of them. There is three particular things in this episode that we want to talk about that are kind of hot button topics. So even if you're not interested in rugby, if you're not doing this rest and see, if you're involved in weight, if you're a power thing or whatever, these are three particular things that are maybe not so much one of them for strength sports, but two of them are very very not hot topics, but New hot tuna. hot tuna. They're very nuanced, very particular training techniques that you might have wondered about using. One of them is recovery methods. So we're just going to touch through some of these. And again, just to emphasize, you know, we're not nitpicking. We're not going to say we could run the lines S and C better than the gentleman here. We're just coming at this from our opinion because it's our YouTube channel. That's probably why you've clicked on this video. So you wanted to hear what we had to say about this stuff. So as always, we will proceed as such. And we'll just give our unbiased, or very biased opinions, what am I saying? Unbiased. Yes, heavily biased. Heavily biased, but uh, particular opinions on these things. So first up, there is blood flow restriction. However, we're just going to listen to the clip and hear what he says he's using it for before we talk about it. Hey. What's going on there? Just occlusion cough, just swarming my knees up. So, Duhan van der Meyer, Mary, Mary, says he's using an occlusion cuff butchered his name mm. for warming up his knees Fitz. great what is an occlusion cuff uh, what is BFR blood flow restriction training an occlusion cuff is is like what you'd see a junkie tying around their arm so their their vein pops out it's anything that restricts blood flow uh, into a limb obviously you wouldn't want to restrict blood flow anywhere else in this case it's on the lower limbs um, and what it is is it's usually some sort of fabric most of the time with a velcro uh tie down on it and it just basically clamps down on your arm or your leg why would you do this so in hypertrophy training a lot of the time what you're looking for is this real big increase or noted increase in the level of blood that's within a capillary bed you'll then get breaking down of that capillary bed in the breakdown of that capillary bed you'll have some sort of repair and then you basically get this angiogenesis along with your hypertrophy increase um, due to the breakdown in the capillary bed from all the blood flowing into it. When we do blood flow restriction training, what we're doing is limiting the amount of blood in the arm. We do our sets and reps as we usually would. And then when we release that cuff, there's a huge amount of blood backed up and that blood will rush into the muscle. And what they're looking for is this kind of proxy of breakdown so the, pro the breakdown is happening due to the blood rushing in and not necessarily due to the actual tissue breakdown itself and then with that that holding back of our of the blood flow we have to use less weight we might have to do less overall volume in most cases we see it being used specifically for hypertrophy not for strength or power work and we see it being used for hypertrophy in an in-season setting where athletes can't be using heavy weights and they can't be doing a lot of volume. Or we see it in a recovery uh, setting. So if somebody has a broken arm and they might have to strap a weight to their wrist, they obviously won't be able to curl a 25 kilo dumbbell. But they might be able to curl a 10 kilo wrist rate weight or something like that. 
and the restricted blood flow will increase their ability to do that. So in this particular case, however, they specifically say, which is great because normally when we look at these videos, reaction videos, we don't get some context. We're just assuming based on what's going on. But in this case, it's great. Uh, Duhan says, Duhan, I feel like that doesn't sound nice. Van der Merve. You know, as well, when you said earlier on about uh, why would you want to use any other limb, but you didn't get anyone some neck training with blood flow restriction. Mm, I fucking hope that. <laughs> so, That's a bit of a survival of the fittest. So he said he's doing it to warm up his knee, okay? And so that seems kind of at odds on paper. Now, I have you don't really see much blood flow restriction stuff on injury, rehab, or return to training. There's a little bit of it, but I don't think there's a plethora of evidence for that. Now, in cases like this, as again, like yesterday, we talked about the science and using science and strength and conditioning, and we shouldn't always rely on science. We should actually do another video about that, talking about where it comes into practical coaching. But in cases like this, I think it is very important to rely and reference the science because you really want to see is something working, okay? But in terms of warming up your knee, he's warming up his knee presumably because he has some kind of knee injury. So typically when we're warming up, we want to do just that, increase the temperature of our tendons, ligaments and muscles, increase the rate of blood flow going there. So that would seem at odds initially if you are looking at restricting the blood flow to that point. So it doesn't seem like it would make a whole lot of sense. You might say after with the increased rush of blood flow make some difference. I would say maybe why would you bother? Would you not just continue to warm up as normal? The other thing then as well is, so obviously pain is entirely perceived by the body. It depends and varies on the person. Pain is, is only something that is individual. So tendon pain, for example, or meniscus pain or whatever he's experiencing here, for example, with tendons, they're incredibly responsive to stimuluses applied to them. So their force, what you perceive, the temperature of them, uh, what movements you're doing, what kind of warm up you're doing. So I'm more than happy in this case to defer to his individual preference and his individual perception of pain and if he feels like this makes his knees less sore before he go, does his strength and conditioning then i would say fair enough but what i'd be saying is that the best way to go about warming up your knee i would say maybe not i could see this being just kind of no reason you can just say no i just could say no like <laughs> i just couldn't see why this would would be doing anything to be honest yeah i i don't see like it makes sense if he thinks it works, then that's fair enough. Again, pain is perceptual, so if he feels like this causes less pain, if you look at this and now we're going, my knees are sore, and I bet you 10% of people watching this are Oh, like, more than 10%. My knees are sore. So when my knees were sore earlier this year, I tried a little bit of the blood flow restriction stuff, and it made absolutely zero difference, amazingly, no. shockingly. I See, in your case as well, you're using your knees all the time in a very high load environment. Absolutely. And it's not like you're taking that load out and then coming in with this low load alternative. Yeah. So it wouldn't make sense, you know. Um, just on the point of the blood flow restriction as well, his application of that is non-ideal and obviously we can't comment on everything but when you're restricting blood flow in the lower limb, you're looking at restricting the main blood coming into the, the leg. So like main uh, avenue for blood coming into the leg is on the medial side of our leg. So you put on that blood flow restriction cuff, you then sit down on a flat box or a bench like he is there and you get this medial swelling of the leg, right? So you're laterally and medially swelling and the top of and the bottom shrink in. That's basically pulling that cuff further and further away from that main source of blood flow. So it really is something you need to take or pay attention to is like, if you're gonna go through all this hassle of restricting blood flow to a leg and then you sit down, obviously it's non-ideal and you'd have to go even tighter. So like, why wouldn't you just lay out flat or lay on your side and do the exercises or stay standing and do the exercises like there's many ways you could just make this a slight bit better there yeah there is nuance to how the blood flow restriction cuffs are applied and it's unlikely it was applied correctly there basically i would say if yeah you, if you were to have a guess uh, and there is real nuance and i think we can do it we wouldn't have no, 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 no like you need clinical practice you need understanding of anatomy you need someone to help you with us and show you the correct methods um, same way you, a junkie might know how to do it, but yeah. you'd prefer a nurse to take your blood as opposed to a junkie. The, there's a very good meta-analysis on, it literally <laughs> just came out. people's blood? Right. <laughs> it literally just came out on blood flow restriction training in rehab of athletic populations. So if you want that, we might link it in the, the old description down below. So next up, in this episode, we also have... The ice chamber, which was... Quite too loud for screaming, like... Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't nice. <laughs> So, 
they have two different chambers one is like 80 degrees and then they go into 130 degrees celsius uh, i always thought they covered your nipples but what no I, I, but, it, but if you cover your hands and your head and your mouth and stuff why your nipples are fucking yeah but why would you not cover your nipples so they go in so cryotherapy obviously is a very very common thing we know about there's nothing particular about the nuance of the way they're using the cryotherapy here uh, cold water immersion therapy is something that is almost synonymous with rugby it's hugely part of rugby I think in a lot of countries cold water now I know cold water immersion therapy and cryotherapy are a little bit different but they're on the same spectrum of recovery tools looking at the research from cold water therapy and cryotherapy it's essentially just neutral there is no it's 50-50 if it does something basically like it, it's one of the most kind of contentious issues in terms of sports recovery you'll find people who will die on a hill for cold water and cryotherapy recovery work you'll find other people who will say it's almost certainly a negative for athletes um you'll see things like cold water single session of cryotherapy will increase testosterone post exercise for two hours but then they'll look at workers in a meatpacking factory and they'll find that they are like uh, 20% below the average testosterone levels of population so you'll say you know there's there's a whole lot of nuance yeah. to cold water immersion you'll have for example cold water immersion therapy an interventionist study where the, both groups will do some kind of resistance training to elicit a response and then after the however long period of people routinely using cold water immersion you'll see someone has had like no it makes no difference whatsoever then you'll see someone else will show that increased testosterone mm-hmm. lowered cortisol and it's it's Almost a shit show in some ways. If you're you know, it's very answer. much a shit show. Yeah. There was a long time with the cold water stuff where if the study took place in Australia, it was effective. <laughs> and outside of Australia, it was non-effective. So that's like what will... That will give you an idea of how... How much of a rat race this is at the moment. Let's just cut it back a small bit, right? And look at why you might want to use cryotherapy, ice something after it's injured. We've all heard of like rest, ice, compression, elevation. First thing you're doing with ice is your limiting inflammation, right? So usually you get a constriction of blood flow to the area, seconds I've talked about it today, that ice brings in the temperature in the injured area or the used area. It will then limit the amount of, of kind of factors going on within that tissue. So if you imagine if I was to tear my arm open right now, there would be a huge hormonal response happen within that arm that would send things like clotting factors, healing factors, all that good stuff will come to the area. When we limit that reaction with with ice, basically what we're looking to do is say, uh, when you were just squatting there, we'll just cut that owie off for a second, we'll just hold that back, and then you can go squat again later and it won't be as, as owie, right? There are issues here, and there are issues with limiting inflammation in almost every application. Now, certain applications where we have an injured person taking anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs um, using an ice pack is very very effective why they're using it here though may not be the most beneficial thing so when we think about inflammation inflammation is the driver of almost all adaptation so even cardiovascular adaptation a lot of that is being driven by inflammation when we get a sports team like this using cryotherapy are they then limiting the amount of physiological adaptation that takes place i think an interesting thing that girf mentioned earlier is why it's so popular in rugby teams there is definitely something to the contact sports and wanting to limit the amount of information possible so if they have a tackling session in the morning they're taking on a lot of kind of non-ideal physiological hurt right it's from completely different from somebody doing 10 sets of 10 in a back squat to me getting kicked in the leg five times and me having sore quads and the other person having sore quads limiting some of that pain and some of that inflammation can be very very beneficial that could be what you're seeing here could also be that kind of psychological boost you get so one of the ways we know we can increase people's resilience is by firstly getting them to undergo cold water immersion or some sort of very very uh acute stressor like this is and then the second way we could get a team to increase their resilience is by undergoing those stressors together. Uh, so it's very likely that we could be getting positive physiological and psychological adaptation from this. But the research at the moment just doesn't show whether that's kind of conclusive, 100% good to go or not. I think likely what happens is in terms of what you see creeping into sports science is the 
relationship between genetic variability and response to training or ability to do certain things and we still need to do part two of that genetics and talent video which we'll do next week so i think what probably happens just like in drug clinical trials is there's different pharmacokinetics per person so different people respond differently to different drugs or the same drug so you have different responses based on your genetics and so i think it's probably similar in regards to cryotherapy and so on and stuff uh, however they are definitely not doing genetic testing yet if any sport is going to be doing it it'll probably be rugby so you got to hand it to rugby they're at the yeah they're usually at the head of uh, snc research because they invest heavily and it's such a snc heavy sport so it'll be interesting to see maybe in like 10 15 years time what what might, might actually happen in regards to kind of specific treatments for specific athletes uh, i just want to say if i had access to cryotherapy and so on every week i'd definitely use it oh yeah absolutely without a doubt, because yeah. there's almost certain health benefits to it but as we know uh high elite performance and being really really healthy are not the same thing regardless of gear use so i would definitely use Jesus, it but nobody's talking about gear use in professional Jesus rugby Jesus Christ! no 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 Jesus no. Christ! finally what we've got is we've got some altitude training i just might listen to this little clip of them using it and this is actually a place where altitude training makes good sense we've got a few games at altitude so when we're playing joburg as soon as we get there we'll go back down to uh, cape town sea level and then we go back to joburg for a couple of the tests we've got to address that with the boys there's a few altitude chambers that we've been using in the strive gym also in our hotel from the altitude center in london we've got some individual altitude masks so the boys get on the what bike and then that simulates the oxygen at altitude. So, we have so they basically have not an altitude or um, an oxygen or airflow restricting mask. What they have is an oxygen restricting pump per player. Mm -hmm. So this is not something everyone will have access to. They have literally a small compressor, the size of a two badgers, I'd say at least, on the front of their watt bike, limiting a very specific amount of oxygen going to these players so their whole area is blocked by these masks and it's limiting games they will be playing in Johannesburg which is at three and a half thousand meters above sea level uh, so most of these UK players none of these are UK or Irish players will have played anywhere near that level there's no one in Ireland above 1100 meters I think Karen Toole we're 50 feet above sea level <laughs> at the moment we're probably below it at the moment so in the UK and Ireland there's nowhere very very little places where you could do actual altitude living or training the ideal case scenario for athletes and altitude training is like we'll often see it in in endurance sports you will have somebody living in an altitude house or sleeping in an altitude chamber most research now will point in the direction of living high and training low being the best solution right so you uh example the university of limerick a lot of the carded endurance athletes there will live in an altitude house it's an entire house sealed the whole way around with controlled oxygen environments um, and most of the kind of student athletes that will be involved in triathlon and um, certain track and field events will live in that house you then go and train at a low altitude or a standard altitude here what's happening to them in that case is they get very high levels of, of kind of intensity and volume done in training so when they go to training they get this huge rush of thick juicy oxygenated air in they can run faster times they can do better volume in their training sessions then when they go back they're getting that positive physiological adaptation from restricted oxygen most of the time when we think about uh, altitude training we're thinking about blood values right so we want uh, high red blood cell counts high hemoglobin we want those tissues to be very 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 effective and efficient at bringing oxygen to the muscles and we want a lot of those molecules within our blood. We want thick, soupy, sticky blood as if you were injecting EPO every second day. But they wouldn't like, be doing that. They wouldn't be doing that. But that's what you're looking for in an altitude situation. In this case, they're living low, training high, or kind of training high, and then coming back down. When we see people doing this in a home setting, they tend to have a, an altitude training mask. I had one in the past. What happens in this case just restricts the amount of air that actually gets into your lungs, right? So you're not really getting these positive blood adaptations because you're just really building bad patterns of breathing, leads to a lot of mouth breathing, it leads to a lot of this kind of big upper chest breath and a lot less of the drawing the diaphragm down. 
Now, in certain cases, like if you've had multiple broken ribs and you've a really restricted lung capacity, it's very, very effective. In the case of this, they're doing the correct thing, right? They have altitude masks on that Garf said, as, it, as Garf said, they restrict the amount of oxygen you get, but you still get the same amount of air coming in and out of your mouth. Why this might be effective for them is probably not physiological, right? So if they're doing three or four sessions on a spinning bike, that's going to do fuck all for them in terms of adjusting blood values, uh, increasing those red blood cell counts. It, it really won't make any difference. The main difference it will make for them is psychological of being used to working incredibly hard while you're going through asphyxiation. Like that's, it's just getting used to that. I'm not able to breathe now, but I know I'll get better in a second. I'm not able to get in anywhere near enough oxygen. I'm feeling faint as I'm running or as I'm exerting myself, but I know that will go away in a second. And that's the real advantage they'll have when they're playing those games or when they did play those games at altitude. So that's the same reason why when we talk about weighted punches or using weighted bat implements that it's always always a bad idea because you're negatively impacting your skill it's like instability training you want to train the skill you want to train what you want to happen in training to happen on your actual sporting event altering it skill stuff does not cause a positive adaption that's a, such a fundamental misunderstanding of how skills work and muscle and power adaption they're two very very different things okay so fine motor patterns and skill like rugby would for example i know conditioning is a little bit less fine pattern than for example swinging a bat or using weighted punches but it's the same idea when we're doing high skilled events or something we want very particular in our sport we want to keep it the same as much as possible so we get quality repetitions at that same thing as frequently and as much as we can as many quality repetitions as we can get at that so altering your training all the time, like Fitz was saying, in terms of an altitude or air or airflow restriction mask would just give you pretty shitty times in training, which is not much you want. No. So if there's anything, sport or video or anything you want to comment on or want us to look at, we'd really appreciate it if you left it in the comments. It's always good to see new stuff. Um, someone else actually was one of the you commenter subscribers pointed this one out which was great to see so any of that stuff we're more than happy to have a look at it if you have sore knees make sure you do check in in the comments below so i guarantee you there's a little community of you with with warm achy knees down there also if you're an off-season rugby player or you're a rugby player who wants to get kind of good gym values even when you're playing in season go and check out the website there's plenty of options there for you uh, and thanks for watching